Yen, give me a second. Oh my god. Come on. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I haven't posted in a while, but I had volleyball and school and just so much going on as well as also still in my first semester of college. So I'm still like adjusting to a new schedule and everything and like dealing with everything. So I like have almost no free time except for when I come home for the weekends. So while I'm home for the weekend, I would like try to post as consistently as possible but dealing with foible, school, study hall, work, everything. It was insane. It still is insane, but I'm just managing a little bit better now that I don't have volleyball going on. So I'm having a lot more free time. And then when I'm home for the weekend, I basically can kind of do what I want. So I have a lot more free time. But the case I wanted to talk about today is the case of Maria Namath. And I actually saw this case like a month or two ago and I had screenshotted it and was like, I want to do this case. Like no one's, I don't see it really that much on YouTube besides like documentary formats. And I was like, great, like I'm going to do this video. And then I saw somebody posted a video about it and I saw it and they recommended it. And I was like, oh my God, like I wanted to do it. Like it doesn't matter. It's not like I was like, you know, going to get like, it's not like it's going to blow up anyways. But I was still like, dang it, like, you know. We had we were thinking the same thing of doing the same case. This is the case of Maria Namath and Fidel Lopez, and it stuck out to me because I saw it on TikTok and I saw how gruesome and graphic it was, and I was like, let me research this. But today I am going to be crocheting a cat bookmark. I just finished crocheting a bag. I would have been working on this. But I actually finished it yesterday. This is my first crochet bag. It's not fully done, but it's almost done. But I think it is so freaking cute. Like, oh my god. Oh my god. I was like, I just need something to crochet while I talk. So let me crochet something quick and simple, like a bookmark. Something that I will use and that is cute. But it's also like not super boring. Okay. But getting right into the case, we are first going to talk about Maria Namath and go into a little bit of what she was like. So Maria Namath was born on April 21st, 1984 in Sunrise, Florida. Not much is known about Maria and her childhood. I really, really tried to search, but I could not find much. So I'm just gonna give the information that I could find and that is as much as I could find after hours and hours and hours of searching. But not much is known about Maria as a child, but she does get married at 23 and this is her first marriage to a man named Norbert. And Maria and Norbert actually ended up being married for eight years until they eventually divorced. And there was no reason given for this divorce. Um, I think they just went separate ways in life. But it was said that Maria as a person was a very polite, soft-spoken, and private person. She had a very good relationship with her family. She was said to be a very family-oriented person, that she loved to be around her family, and anything that involved her family, she wanted to be there with them. And while she had a very good relationship with her family, she did not get to see them that much because her family did live in Peru while she did live in Florida. It was said that while she lived in Florida and her family lived in Peru, they did keep in touch through Facebook and they still had a very good relationship. Maria did have a job in an apartment complex in Sunrise, Florida called Apalaca, and she had worked with this apartment complex for about five to six years, and she was an assistant manager. Maria's job as an assistant manager was to just oversee any damage, to check the money, to make sure everything was safe in these apartments, and that everyone was basically happy. And it was also said that Maria very much loved to sightsee, and that she also loved to take pictures. Photography was something that she was very passionate about, and I think it wasn't a main hobby of hers, but it was just something that she liked to do on the side. And now that we have discussed Maria a little bit, I am going to go ahead and go into Fidel, which I really do wish I could find more information about Maria, but sadly, there is just not a lot of information about her. And when you search up Maria name it, it does not automatically come up with Maria's murder. It comes up uh, someone that died in the Holocaust. So immediately searching up Maria Namath comes up with someone not similar and everything different. So as much as I would love to talk more about the victim and spend much more time on her and her life, that is all I could find about her. 
My name is Fidel Lopez. He was born on March 28th, 1991, and he was 25 years old at the time of the case. And as well as Maria, there's not much information known about Fidel. We know some of the things that he has done in his past, but we don't know anything from his childhood up until he was around 20s. Actually, before Fidel and Maria met, Fidel did have two kids with his ex-girlfriend, and he was living with her while they were still separated at the time. Fidel did have a job as a mechanic, and it was said that he was also a drinker, a very loud and obnoxious drinker. He was known to be obnoxious and aggressive when he drank and that it was something he could not control. Before Fidel had met Maria, he did have legal trouble dealing with alcohol in his past. Now that we have discussed both of the main people in today's case, I would like to go ahead and talk about how they met. So Maria and Fidel had actually met a year before the events of today's case. So before Fidel and Maria had met, Maria had just been in an eight year long marriage with Norbert. So when she got out of this marriage, it was hard for her to start dating again because she was kind of at an awkward age where you're 30 years old. And so it's kind of hard to start getting back into that dating scene. But when she met Fidel, she was 30 years old and they had actually met each other while clubbing. They are both said to be quite heavy drinkers and they did like to party. So while they met at a club, they decided to hang out. And in the first month of them dating, Fidel said that they went clubbing and partying a lot. But as the relationship got a little bit longer, they started to fizzle out a little more and they just started to watch movies and go out to dinners together. While they were together, they had lived in Hollywood Beach together. Then they moved to Hialeah and then they went back to Sunrise, Florida. Before Maria and Fidel had actually moved into an apartment of their own, Maria and Fidel had lived with Fidel's brother, sister, and mother. And this was all while Maria's family was living in Peru and they did not go clubbing nearly as much. Also, another dynamic of this relationship was that Fidel did not have a car and so he used Maria's car to get everywhere, um, to work, to go buy alcohol, anything he wanted because Maria didn't need it as she could just walk to the apartment complex. Now going over the two people in today's case that are most important, I'm going to go ahead and go into the night of today's case. So one thing that is tricky about today's case is it is all from Fidel's account. I'm going based off the interrogation footage and we do have the mostly the full story that we believe to be true, but Fidel did lie and lie and lie and he said several stories in this interrogation. It was very difficult to get through and get a clear cut picture of what happened because Fidel was lying so much. So I'm going to go based off of Fidel's account in order from his first lie to his second lie to the actual story and what actually happened that night. But this story did come off of Fidel's account because he was the only one alive after this and the only one who could tell that story. The day that this case takes place is the 15th of September in 2015. And according to Fidel, he got off work around 4.20 and he drove home to go ahead and get dinner. According to Fidel, dinner was already ready for him. It was chicken, beans, and rice. And Maria had already made it all for him and it was prepared. Uh, she, she was cooking dinner, it was ready made. And what did you guys eat? At the house. Yeah, what did you eat? What did, what did you uh, we, uh, she made chicken, mm -hmm. chicken, um, and uh, beans and rice. So after dinner, Fidel and Maria went to go see Fidel's mother. And according to Fidel's mother, the couple seemed in love and nothing seemed wrong. They seemed completely okay and everything was well. And after going to go ahead and visit Fidel's mother, they had decided to go ahead and go to Chili's and get some margaritas just to drink a little bit. So while they headed to Chili's, they were actually there by themselves. So no one can account for what happened. But according to Fidel, it was just them by themselves. They drank a couple margaritas and then they went to the ABC store to get a 800 bottle of tequila. And then we buy a bottle of um, um, 18, 1800 or something like that. Okay. I, I, I never drank that before as so. well. And Fidel said that at this point, Maria was already tipsy, but they had gotten home before 10. According to Fidel, they start drinking, talking, playing music. And during this time, Fidel says that he can handle it, but that she went a lot crazy. She got a little crazy and she was, she was a lot crazy. So. According to Fidel, she started drinking and she became very crazy, very out of control. And during this time, they started having sex and she started asking him for things that made him uncomfortable. 
During this time, as Fidel was explaining the story, he starts to explain that Maria started asking him to use the empty 800 tequila bottle um, to be used inside of her for sexual purposes and then also to have his arm inside of her. She want me to pull my, you know, my arm and her pussy and, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, like a open mind and here up and says, I don't know. And then he says that at this time, she claims she has to go throw up. So she goes to the bathroom. She walks to the bathroom. He says that. Um, she walked to the bathroom herself and he goes outside to smoke a cigarette. And then he says that when he comes back inside from smoking a cigarette, there is a glass sliding door into the apartment that he says it suddenly broke. It broke into shreds everywhere. It was a complete mess. But he says he does not remember bringing it and he doesn't know why he broke it. But he does admit that he knew he did it. There's some damage to the doors. I don't remember, man. Walls. Was there any damage in that house prior to tonight? No, in the house there was no, no damage at all. The house was completely uh, restored. Like, everything was clean. and in order. No holes in the walls, no broken no doors. No holes in the wall. If you see holes in the wall, then I did that. He says that as he reaches the bathroom door, he sees Maria lying on the floor, barely conscious and barely breathing. And he says that she has raspy breaths going on. He says he does not even remember calling 911. He doesn't remember whose phone he got, whose phone he used. He just remembered grabbing a phone that he saw and dialing 911. He says that at this time, he could not focus on anything else but helping Maria. So on the phone, the 911 operator was asking for an address, but he could not give it to her because he was so focused on Maria and getting her help. One, what is your emergency? Hello, He says he puts cold water on her face from the bathtub slash shower trying to wake her up and he also gives her CPR. And this whole time in the interrogation, he says he cannot remember anything. He can't remember anything. Oh, I don't know. I'm doing my best. I'm trying to remember what I'm saying. I don't really remember anything. But he's also telling a clear cut story of what's happening, just leaving out very specific details. And he's also saying things like when girls get drunk, explaining to the interrogators like, oh, you know what I mean? Like why when certain girls do this? And soon after Fidel calls 911, an ambulance does show up to the apartment and pronounces Maria dead. Whenever the ambulance does show up and declare Maria dead, um, the crime scene had blood all over, all over the walls, the doors, the sliding glass door to the apartment was broken and glass was everywhere, the closet door was broken, and Maria was found naked in a pool of her own blood with tissue portions everywhere, all over the apartment, and it was very clear that this was not an accident. After he tells this story, which is a very vague story of what happens, the interrogators start to press for certain details. And so the interrogators ask for a more descriptive telling of this story. They state that in order to be this much blood at the crime scene, because there was blood everywhere, all over the walls, all over the floor, Maria was covered in a pool of her own blood. For there to be this much blood, something must have happened, an argument must have happened before to cause Fidel to get this mad. And Fidel does admit that they were arguing uh, because Maria wanted to go to live with her family in Peru because she missed them and she loved them. But Fidel did not like this idea and he even said himself that he feels like he would not make her happy if she wanted to make that decision. And another thing he brought up is, I use her car. Fidel claims that he said to Maria, let's not F this up. 
and I'm not upset. He then claims they have makeup sex after this, and this is when all the events take place. So at this point, Fidel is claiming that they went out to dinner, they went to go get margaritas, they went to the ABC store, they came back, they had a big argument while drinking. Fidel destroyed the apartment, he broke the sliding glass door, broke several things in the apartment causing a lot of damage that he admits was him, but he doesn't remember what caused him to do this. He doesn't remember the argument at all. And then he claims that Maria and him start having makeup sex and she wants all these things done to her, like using the 1800 bottle and using his arm. He claims that all the blood from Maria was consensual, that she wanted this sex, she wanted his arm used on her, she wanted the 1800 bottle, that all of this was an accident, but all the broken glass door and the broken closet door was just him being mad. Now, those are two separate incidents and it was not all happening at the same time. But all this time, he's claiming that he can't remember what happened in the argument to cause him to be so upset. You, you've got to be able to explain what happened here. Oh man, we both were drunk. I'm, I don't know. I really don't know. I was so drunk and she was so drunk. I really don't know, man. I wish I can explain better. I wish I can explain better. I, I'm telling you everything I remember, man. I'm, you know, I'm fucking telling you everything, everything I remember, like, you know, almost exactly how it is. Almost is the key. Exactly. Oh, it's almost. Because I don't, I don't remember everything. But, but I think you... The whole time that Fidel is denying that he cannot remember anything and that nothing is making sense, the interrogators are pushing him to remember that something did happen, an argument did happen because... The way that Maria's body looks when she died could not have happened from the 1800 bottle and just his arm going up inside of her. There was tissue all over the floor, there was bruising on her insides, and there was blood everywhere. This did not happen from his arm and the 1800 bottle. The whole time they're pushing him to remember, remember, remember because they know that he does remember and they know that he is just scared to admit it because he knows that he did these things to her and that is what caused her body to look the way it did whenever the ambulance found her. But then suddenly, while the interrogators kept asking questions, he does kind of blurt out, maybe an ex-husband, maybe the ex-husband, that's all he says. But then he goes on to say, it definitely could not have been the ex-husband because I don't get mad because of him, is what he says. Uh, so somebody from her family don't like him or something. Don't mention him like a, like a good thing, you know, just something like a bad thing, but still mentioning him. But I don't think that's a reason why I get mad. I get mad for something else. I don't remember whatever I break or whatever I do. You, do, you get, do you get upset when she brings up her husband or brings up past relationships? Uh, not really, man. You know, like, she never does that. She knows that. She never does that. I mean, like, she never talk about her. Is, she knows he's a motherfucker, I mean, between you and I. Yeah. Yeah, she knows that he's not a good guy, so she never she never put him in conversation, things like that. No. So I never get mad because of that. Today she mentioned him but because of somebody of her family don't like him, that's all. The interrogators then begin to ask Fidel if there's any abuse in the relationship, if he ever hit her, if she ever hit him. And Fidel says in one straight sentence that she never hit him, but once she did hit him, and she actually hit him three times, but she never hit him. And that was all in one sentence. So Fidel is changing his story every five seconds at this point, and he cannot keep a straight lie going because he's changing so many things every few seconds and contradicting himself every few seconds. And then he's saying that is when they had makeup sex and that is when all this blood happened and she was accidentally just passed away. So then the interrogators ask for a little bit more details about the sex because obviously they know this is when things started to go south Maria and that Fidel is not telling the full truth here. So the interrogators use what he said about the ex-husband and start to bring him up a little bit more saying, okay, well, tell us about the ex-husband. Maybe that made you mad. Maybe that's what's upsetting you. All this stuff, trying to bring it out of him because he's very clearly does remember what happened, but he's leaving out that big chunk because he doesn't want to admit that 
he does remember. And when they're asking about the details about this sex, he's claiming that he used the 1800 bottle inside of Maria. He then used his arm and he states himself that there was nothing in between. But then five seconds later, he did say that he used his penis in between. So once again, five seconds later, he's contradicting his own statement. And he consistently says that I did not finish. I did not come because he hates blood. He makes sure to let the interrogators know that he did not finish several times. And when he goes into more details, he once again states that Maria walked from the closet to the bathroom to go ahead and throw up. The doggy style from behind. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't know if we did it from behind. I really don't remember. I think so too. So mm -hmm. how did she get from the closet to the bathroom? Walking. Oh, so she did walk. Yeah, she did walk. She was, she was wrong, but she was okay. But she and while they were in the closet having sex, she was on all fours. And then when she moved to the bathroom, she was on all fours once again. But he did not mention that she was all fours the first time when she went to the bathroom. He said that she just went straight from the closet to the bathroom to throw up. But now he's saying that she went to the bathroom and they started using the 1800 bottle on her once again. So first time he did not mention the 1800 bottle and now he's saying that the tequila bottle was being used on her in the bathroom. So once again, which one is it? And the interrogators also bring up that there was a flat iron and a flashlight on the floor of the crime scene. And Fidel says that he does not remember anything about using those on Maria, but that maybe. And throughout this whole interview, he is also always saying that I'm always true. I'm always telling the truth. I'm being truthful with y'all. I wouldn't lie. I love Maria. I would do anything for her. All I wanted to do was make her happy. And when the interrogators ask what the most extreme thing that Maria and Fidel have done in the relationship sexual wise is 69, the interrogators then point out, how is it that that's the, that is the craziest thing that y'all have done? But now Maria is asking for you to use your arm on her and an empty 1800 bottle. It doesn't jump from just one thing to another. Fidel also says to the interrogators that she was just drunk, 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 and that she was the one to clean it the next day, not me. And he was referring to the blood in the situation, showing just how much blood there was all over the floor. That's a lot of blood, I know. And the closet and everywhere. And the bathroom between the closet and the bathroom, there was a lot of blood. I know, yes. it's a lot of blood. Did you try to clean it? No, man. Why should I have to try and clean it? She, she was the one to have to clean it the next day. No, man. But then when they start asking about the blood, saying this amount of blood cannot come just from you putting in 1800 bottle up her in your arm that something else must have happened here he then started to say oh well she had hepatitis b and that's what's causing her to bleed so much but he never mentioned it up until this point when they ask about why is there so much blood so at this point the interrogators take a break and go ahead and give fidel a few seconds and during this break time fidel does start to draw and doodle which is an interesting reaction to this while he's being questioned about the supposed love of his life's murder but whenever the interrogators come back this is when fidel starts to tell his second story the interrogators start to take it a little bit more seriously be a little bit more insistent about his story they were a little bit nicer beforehand whereas now they're really wanting answers and they start to tell him that it takes a man to own up to what he's done to admit to his fault and to really just own up and admit so at this point, Fidel kind of gets quiet. He's running his hands through his hair. He's sighing. He's mumbling. He very clearly knows that they know what's going on and he's not going to get away with this. He starts to say that whenever they got back and they were drinking and talking, she started talking about wanting to go to Peru with her family. And he even says that he was mad because he wouldn't be able to use her car. Fidel then said that they made peace and they started having sex. And then while having sex, Maria called him the other fucking guy. I know we made peace, but when we were doing the uh, making love, she told me something that I really don't. It just she she changed my name. She called me the, the other fucking name of the other guy, and then she said it twice. Everything went for a little because she was confusing me with the other guy. He said that he started getting mad, and it made him feel bad. And then he says he now remembers putting a flat iron in Maria. At this point, Fidel's new story is that they came back to the apartment. They fought about Marie wanting to go see her family. They made up. They made peace. And as they start having sex, Maria starts calling him Norbert, her ex-husband's name. And he starts to become very angry. And he starts to 
assault her with the 1800 bottle with his arm and with a flat iron. And this is all while he is also destroying the apartment with the sliding glass window and the closet door being broken. And all while this is happening, he then says, something really bother me right now. How many years am I going to jail? So all while this is happening, Fidelo is just concerned about what his consequences will be and how he will look to other people. And once again, there's another break for the interrogators to go ahead and grab the pictures of the crime scene to see if they can get any more information out of Fidel. And so when they come back with the pictures of the crime scene and Maria's body, Fidel then admits that she was unconscious the whole time and she never consented to anything. This out. And the fact that you're saying that she wanted this is disturbing. No, she didn't want these. No, and she didn't want that. Of course not. He now states that she never asked for anything. She never asked for the 1800 bottle and she never asked for his arm or the flat iron. That you put inside of her? Yeah, I put inside of her. Did she ask you to put that inside of her? No, man. She was some conscious, but I thought do these already. She... At what point did she go unconscious? What point in this, this incident? From the beginning, man. From the beginning? And then he starts to blame the alcohol, saying he wasn't thinking straight and he drank way too much. After Fidel does finally admit to what he did, he then does claim that they did go to Chili's, they did go to the ABC store, but whenever they got back to the apartment, they did get into an argument and Fidel did say they made up. But as they started having sex and Maria started calling him Norbert, he became very angry and he started to destroy everything in the apartment and whenever he calmed down, Maria was unconscious and that is when he decided to assault her with his arm, the 1800 bottle and the flat iron. And while also sticking his arm up inside of Maria, he then began to tear out her tissue and destroy her from the inside. So at this time, the interrogators take another break and they come back and they then arrest him for the murder of Maria Namath. This case is very tricky because Fidel lied the whole way through the interrogation. He changed his story several times and it was very difficult to follow along and make a clear picture of what actually happened. Fidel lied so many times and wouldn't own up to what he actually did. And he tried to play it off as a mishap during sex, something accidentally happened. But whenever interrogators gave him the proof and said, there is this much blood and that cannot happen, by accident, you had to do something to her. That is when Fidel kind of realized, okay, I'm stuck in this situation. They clearly have evidence that this was not consensual and I have to own up to what I've done. And another thing that interrogators gave was how much blood there was on the floor that Maria would not have been enjoying this. The whole time Fidel loved to say that Maria was asking for this. She wanted this, she consented to this, she was enjoying it, but they were able to show with how much damage done to her body, there's no way she would have been enjoying this with how much pain she would have been in. So he was hurting her whether he liked it or not. And according to the autopsy, Maria died from blood loss and she had a blow to the back of her head as well as bruising and cuts all over her body, specifically on her uterus and her anus. Maria had a one fourth inch tissue portions out. She had 20 to 163 inch portions out of her body and she had three and a half inch cuts from her uterus to her anus. And supposedly this cut was so bad, you couldn't differentiate between her uterus and her anus. And Fidel did plead guilty to murder and sexual battery in the first degree, not eligible to, for parole or eligible to appeal his sentence. And he will spend the rest of his life in prison. So talking about this case is very difficult because Fidel, is someone who I think is a very violent and scary person. It's hard to even put yourself in Maria's situation because I really couldn't. I, I don't, I can't even imagine going through that. But my hope is that like he said, she was unconscious the whole time while he was ripping tissue out of her body and assaulting her. I know she must have been in a great, great deal of pain, but my biggest hope is that she would have been unconscious for most of the time and hopefully passed away very soon into the assault so she wouldn't have had to be awake for most of it. But that is wishful thinking and I know she must have suffered 
in her last little bit of life. Overall, covering this case was definitely a eye-opening experience to know how controlling and scary men can be because all Maria did was say the name of her ex-husband and she had a awful and torturous death. Fidel was very clearly someone who had issues beforehand because yes, calling someone the wrong name is going to make anyone upset, but your reaction to it is what determines what kind of person you are and Fidel's reaction to it is what determined how awful of a person he was. But my crochet did not work out because I got bored of it halfway through and I just started like doing nothing. So nothing turned out of that, but it's okay. I'm gonna just crochet it later. But anyways, I hope that this video was somewhat enjoyable. It was very hard to piece together with Fidel's interrogation and get information on this case. But it was one that I was excited to research and get some information on. So I hope y'all enjoyed it. And yeah. I am home. <sighs> okay. Ah. Today was the, is the case of Maria Nunez and Fidel. Maria Nanette 